Hi, everybody. RP, it's Friday. Um, I think I want to speak philosophically today a little bit, but uh, and we'll work our way into it. Um, I want to start uh, with something here. So tomorrow, tomorrow is MS Day. Um, RP, you know and love Kristen, right? Yeah, of course. Kristen, come say hi, just for one second. Hi, Kristen. Now, now I'm embarrassed. Okay, but 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 thank you for coming on. Kristen is our loving and wonderfully talented partner in in this show, and has MS. Um. And so we're going to celebrate MS Day with her. We've been working on a film. Um, what I love about the film is that um, it's not a bad thing, Kristen, right, that the solution or, or a powerful part of a solution to MS is togetherness and conversation, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's your community wherever you find it. Yeah. And so, and I, and I, you know, I stress this when Vivek Morthy was on and, you know, in other places, this isn't like a feel goody thing. This is a, a medical thing. Okay. And I'm, everyone think about that. What I'm saying is that if you have meaningful conversations and connections to people with certain ailments, they get, they, they get better, medically better, not just better mood, medically better. And they, some people don't get sick in the first place because they're in communities that have that kind of power. Now, these, these are, by the way, some of this is relates to MS. Some of it's a variety of other ailments. So it's just sort of a universal thing, generally speaking. So anyway, Kristen, I wanted to, in, in, in honor of you, celebrate this and watch this film that we, the trailer to the film that we're making, um, just as a moment of observation. You good with that? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thank you for everything you do, Kristen. It's a real pleasure to work with you. There's not a person out there watching this right now who doesn't know someone with MS. The fact that we don't have that kind of rallying cry bugs me. MS can be totally terrifying, but certainly what makes MS so warped is that you don't know what's going to happen to you. Boy, if I could make a bargain, I can live like this. We just can't imagine what our lives are going to be like in the future. I'm scared because of my daughter, because I want to be there for her. It's a monstrous realization. Wow, there are forces greater than you within your own body. It's heavy. If I had known, I would have done other things with my life. I was engaged. That relationship dissolved soon after I got out of the hospital. I was alone. Literally, the doctor who gave me the diagnosis basically just said to me, almost like, you need to go home and die. People hear you have MS and they immediately go to the darkest place possible. I think when people retreat from the world, the brain suffers. I'll never forget that loss of control and also not knowing when it's going to be over. The fear of the unknown ends up being a lot scarier than the known. To withdraw and suffer alone is probably one of the most painful human experiences there is. <laughs> to communicate, to have fellowship, being with a person, is probably one of the greatest gifts that we can give. What comes is better than what came before. Human connection plays a huge role, not just in helping MS patients cope and function, but it actually is life-giving to the brain. You have potential to really have a great life, or really make yourself better, or really find love, or really get the job that you want. You can do this. Look at me, I'm, I'm playing drums. I'm doing what I love. 
and I'm not letting Anna stop me. When you do what you love, it gives me energy. Everybody gonna dance tonight. What Everybody the world tells you is, this is going to get worse, it's going to end badly. It doesn't have to be true. Everybody's gonna jump and shout. Everybody's gonna sing it out. Everybody's gonna dance around tonight. Everybody's gonna dance around tonight. So there you have it. That's uh, a bunch of people on our team made that. Good job, guys, and Kristen. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to use this uh, as a lead in to today. So, you know, I, uh, I, I didn't sleep very well last night and uh, it's for a variety of reasons. And, and, and I'm going to just outline a couple. We're going to talk about that David Brooks article because I think the David Brooks article sits at, sits at the center of what's going on right now, right at the center. And I'm going to try to connect some dots here and I'm probably going to fail. And if you can help me do them or if you think I'm wacky, you can say that too, but I want to connect some dots. So yesterday was Clint Watts day. Yesterday was disinformation day. Yesterday was, man, is this freaking challenging from the point of view of understanding a theme and a center and a story. It's really hard because there are malignancies that sort of invade it. Then there's these more benign problems that, and just I'm just mean from the point of intent that, that also get in the way. And then there's some wacky actors who jump in and really screw it up. You know, it's really hard. And so I had a moment, RP, on, on a call that you were part, you and I were part of last night. And just to characterize it, RP does such a nice job of sort of setting the groundwork for the facts of the day. And that's just so important to people to sort of use those things. Um, you know, my role, which is smaller and less, is to be like the wacky hippie from, you know, who goes into the world. And then the rest of the people run the world. I mean, that's how this thing works. We were the call we were on yesterday, yeah. Yeah. And so I was really disappointed when I heard from a pretty big business person who basically said, we're going back to business as usual. Now, I don't think he's being malignant. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, huge business person. You can't say who it was, but. Right. Huge. And I was like, so disappointed now, now. And I lay in bed thinking, because I do this, I think like, I'm such a loser. Like I'm like the bleeding heart, like freak show who gets emotional about things and doesn't think through things rationally. Now that's just the way my brain and my heart works. I actually don't think that's true. I, I think I have my own role to play in, in all of this. Um, but I was really saddened by it. I mean, I, I really thought like, man, it's true that we're gonna quote, go back. Okay, now in this case, we were talking about sort of business processes. But I think the author, the other part of going back to me is we're going to go back, which, by the way, we never left. Uh, the, the reality distortion, which is what is the nature of humans and what's the nature of Americans and how do we sort of love or not love each other? I think the things that we fight over are uh, exaggerated, made up and made more difficult by the state of the way we communicate with each other. Broadly thinking it's media, but it's more than that. OK, so. Um, so the first thing I did this morning, one of the first things I did this morning is I read the David Brooks article from yesterday. Dan had sent it to me and I loved it. And I'll talk about it in a minute. And it really struck me. And again, I'm coming off this night of like, man, you're just a dreamer and the world is the good, the good that we've drawn out will go just go back. And that's just the way my, my, I go on roller coasters. And then I read the David Brooks article and it made me feel like, yeah, he's right, man. And this is RP has been saying this and I want to be part of that, so I'm going to say that to RP today. And then I read, when they start looting, we start shooting. That's what the damn tweet says. And it broke my heart. I'm not kidding. I just read it, and I thought, what? Like, how can you write that? You know, it, it, this is the United States of America. Like, and, and why why is that different? It's different because we're, you know, we, we signed a constitution and made a deal to make a more perfect union. And it carries with it all kinds of responsibilities and maturities. There's a mature approach. There's a loving approach to these things that, by the way, there can be great order in our disorder. There has been for many, most of our culture. 
But when I read that headline, I just like it broke my heart. Not a headline. It's a tweet. It's a direct communication from the guy in charge. That's what it is. OK, we'll get back to that. And I'm just a white dude in Connecticut. So and so is RP. So that's who we are. However, however, I'm going to characterize as best I can. And I'm going to read a quote from uh, David Brooks's article. I and mean, basically what David Brooks is saying that throughout our history, there's been these incredible moments of leadership that are so difference making. And they come from a variety of people. They come from Ronald Reagan and they come from Bobby Kennedy. You know, this is not, they come from Barack Obama. I mean, you just think of what, who Nelson Mandela is. Like think about the mantle that that guy creates and what level of leadership that is and what good that does for the world. It's outrageous. Um, there's a quote in the, in the David Brooks article. Tim Armstrong actually sent it to me too. In our sleep, pain, which cannot forget falls drop by drop on the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Bobby Kennedy said that um, when he announced to a crowd, and if it's, it may be hard for you to imagine, I think it was Cincinnati. It was in Ohio City where Bobby Kennedy, the morning after Martin Luther King had been killed, had to announce to the crowd, a predominantly black crowd, that he had been killed. And, you know, it, today that would never happen because it would be all over the Internet the minute it happened. But in those days, because the papers hadn't really hit yet, no one knew and, and the way that they reacted. So it was like this incredible moment of leadership. Um, and, you know, and David Brooks talks about the despair of that. And then I read this quote and then I was reacting to what I heard last night. And then I was reacting to what I heard from Clint yesterday. And I thought, you know what? Our job is to make the message clearer, make the ask more profound, and not let it just go in some direction that it doesn't have to go in. And if I feel awkward at times or afraid at times, and not just me, but any of us, okay, well then that's the fight that, that we're in. Uh, I know we have said, and I believe this now, I don't want this to be all about politics. I think this is just a moment of individual leadership is really what it is. And all the, there's a million issues that surround it. I know all that. But that's pretty disappointing. And, it, and it's particularly ironic in the reading this David Brooks, which I recommend that you all read it today, article, that those two things happen. For me, it happened like 20 minutes apart. So, all right, RP, that was a mouthful. I was very clear and very powerful. <clears throat> um, I, I thank you also for tying it into yesterday. I think that's a very, a really constructive and concrete way for us to move forward on this unbelievably important question. Um, democratic nations uh, survive or die based on shared principles and unity, right? And this country is this huge experiment in diversity under some idea of some sort of shared principles and disinformation back to Clint Watts yesterday or divisiveness. Um, you know, there's two vectors of that to look at, right? So one is the breadth of the divisiveness, so the forces that try to pull us apart. And there's the ones we all grew up with, you know, Russia and China and the obvious ones. And then there's the ones of our, who we are as individuals, where we try to push ourselves apart, right? And historically, there's been tools to share these ideas and some ideas are dangerous and some ideas are helpful towards the idea of a republic, right? So the, from the printing press to social media, we've dramatically accelerated the ability to share good news and to share division. And so people thought about this at the beginning of the internet. They realized how dangerous it could be as well as obviously very powerful towards good. So the breadth of the ability to see divisiveness or distance formation is, is, is historically used to sit around the fringe. Even pre-corona, disinformation, these things largely was in the fringe. That's why Russian hacking of the previous election, federal election, was such a big deal because it spread into the mainstream and actually had a mainstream non-fringe impact. So now divisiveness and misinformation are moving into the mainstream. So that's, pre, that's, that's almost pre-corona. Then you add, again, on this breadth, and then for depth, you add where we find ourselves today, right? We are in a pressure cooker. So we're in a pressure cooker just from the disease alone, period, full stop. 
People are dying. Who? Where? Am I going to get it? Unbelievable stress. Is my family okay? That stress is lessened over time. We're learning more, but we're in a pressure cooker. The second thing that's happening inside that depth question is the economic collapse. We are amidst an economic collapse. 25% of American workers are filing for unemployment. Holy shit. And by the way, there are more major unemployment announcements coming today. I was with the CEO yesterday of a major corporation who's laying off 25% of his staff today. It's not over. So depth, pressure cooker, disease, economic collapse. Add to that what David Brooks talked a lot about. We have a leadership, at least a leadership void, and I'm going to accelerate that in a second. You know, we, I keep saying herd animals, limbic, all these things. I don't know if they resonate, but neighborhood, actually, it's the same thing, Tom, right? Why do we care about a neighborhood? Because we care about, our, we are, you know, we are happier, we are more fulfilled, we are better when we have a sense of community. So that I say herd and limbic, but that's neighborhood, that's community, that's who we are. And part of what that means about us is we want to know that we as a community are safe and things will be okay. And that's when we look to leaders. And David Brooks did a lovely job making that point, going through a whole series of leaders and a series of tragedies where we looked to, you know, from the Challenger explosion to Gettysburg to 9-11 to 08, we looked to a leader who put their hand on our shoulder and said, we're going to get through this together. And partisanship went away. So we don't have that leader. Part one, we don't have that leader. Instead of not only not having that leader, we have acid, divisive acid coming out of where that leader is supposed to be. Yeah. When they start looting, we start shooting. Well, by the way, and I just want to add one thing to you, what you just said, which is he points out that those leaders step into that divide and bring it. Absolutely. And they, you know, uh, Clint Watts was saying it yesterday, Democratic or Republican, Democrat or Republican on, you know, whatever it was like 9-13-01, when Trump went down to Bush. the, excuse me, Bush went down to the towers, grabbed the bullhorn. It didn't matter what party you were. You know, remember, here's, a, here's an example. It didn't matter what party you were in America. We all, our neighborhood, it became a neighborhood. It became a tribe. It became a herd. That's what we as biological organisms want. That's what we as a nation need or we fall apart, right? Guess what else happened? We had a global neighborhood for a moment. The headline of Le Monde, the Paris newspaper. Remember, France and the U.S. have an unbelievable history of antagonism said, we are all Americans on 9-12. The whole world came together for a moment. Every great leader wants a crisis. I've talked to a lot of leaders, uh, government leaders, leaders of nations, leaders of states, leaders of corporations during Corona. Every great leader wants a crisis. They don't want the impact on their people. They want to show they can lead. They want to be the one who brings you from the horror to the hope. This leader did not want this crisis. He didn't want to be president. I know that. He certainly didn't want this crisis. And David Brooks does an amazing job of dissecting. And there's one line in here. And we, look, we, we do a good job not being political, so let's not break the rule right now. Um, and so I'll, I won't even use the name. But you need a leader who can fathom empathy, express empathy, laugh and cry, love or be loved see the true existence of other human beings except insofar as they are good or bad for himself and i took the name of the person that he's talking about out of that so that you don't have a limbic response to it depending on where you sit on the spectrum but in this moment you want a person you can relate to you know is taking care of you this this op-ed by david brooks is one of the best things i've ever read. yeah um and and again so how's he concluded tom where you and i have been for 55 conversations that the leadership isn't there. The leadership has to be here. You have to lead for yourself, for your family, for your company, for your neighborhood, for your state, for your country. It isn't coming from there. We're so used to looking for it. You know, remember your old high school biology about the alpha or the omega, and everyone else sort of sits in between. Well, there's no alpha right now leading, so you have to be the alpha. You have to be the leader of the tribe. And it could be a tribe of one or it could be a tribe of 330 million. And so that's why Stacy, other great leaders who are doing their thing are so unbelievably important right now. Because not only, and look, by the way, uh, Tom, in our conversation last night that you're referring to, 
another great business leader, when you sort of made this point, jumped in and said, the point I'm making about the, the corrosiveness. You made your great point about how Twitter's a lie and we all love each other more than we think. And we're having battles. We don't, we, we think we're in a war, we're not. And this one, you know, billionaire business leader said, how are we supposed to come together when we have garbage like this coming out of the White House? When yeah. we have a leader literally trying to pull apart a country. And I'll conclude with my point. This is not a totalitarian state. We aren't forced to be together. We're for, we are together because we have shared ideals and the leadership of the White House is supposed to remind us of those. And that's what David Brooks does a lovely job reminding us of today. So, so maybe we got a little partisan there. Sorry. It's not partisan. It's nothing to, I didn't know about who you're going to vote for. It's about what's the reality we're in right now and how well, we. I, yeah. yeah. It, it's also. I'm sorry. I'm pausing. I'm just in my brain trying to, to, to settle this, this political notion in the midst of the whole thing. It's, it's just it, what you were referring to at the end. If you really, I was saying to Kristen earlier, you know, I, I got to take constitutional law at Yale with Akhil Amar, who's like one of the lead constitutional law guys in America. And he gave this great opening talk. And he, he, he talked about the uniqueness of America, the uniqueness of the Constitution. And he's an Indian born guy. And he, you know, very much praises uh, so many aspects of what the Constitution is. And this isn't the word he used, but I'm going to use it anyway. You know, so much of this is built around a passionate love of a concept. Like that's the idea, right? And so within that, there's this level of responsibility that goes along with creating this opportunity. And no one says it's perfect, but nothing is. And what's a path to better? What's a path to perfect? Well, it includes leaders at critical mo moments making, I, I, I can't think of a better word than mature. It sounds crazy to say it, but don't be a child in the moment of fear and panic. Be the person who steps forward and brings calm and resolve and restraint. I mean, you just think about what restraint is. What does that bring to the table? I'm sorry, man. If it's really hard to read when they start leading, we start shooting. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what that means. It means, I, it means I want to exercise my base so they come out and vote for me. And it means the 300,000 swing voters in eight states that, that Trump needs to vote for him to stay in office, um, he knows pretty well that they'll bite on something like that. Well, and I, and I think everyone knows this, but procedurally in the United States, that's a, you're not allowed to do that. That's not within the law to do what, he, what that statement says. That's against the law. An incitement to violence? Well, an incitement to violence, but also if someone loots, you got to go try to arrest them in a peaceful way. That's your job as a policeman, not to shoot them. I mean, that's absurd. The, um, you know, it's funny, Tom, is we're, um, it's not like, it's not like we're clearly not discovering this theory that America needs leadership and shared ideals, right? So go pick up a quarter and, and read what, it, read it, pick up a dime, pick up a quarter and read what it says in the back, right? E pluribus unum, out of many, one, right? Remember what the, when they went to go sign the Declaration of Independence, they said to each other, we either hang together or we hang separately. And, um, and that, and, and what I think what we're, we're the, the, what we're describing here is, um, in a time of crisis, these diverse strands of what it means to be in America and where we come from and what neighborhoods we're in and what tribes we are and what races we are have to be pulled together uh, about our shared ideals by one leader. And if you don't have that leader, nay, in fact, if you have that leader throwing acid, I, I Tom, I, I had a, a meeting today with a huge group of investors, uh, one of the largest pension funds in the world. And I said, um, and I, it came out of my mouth before I could really stop it. I said, I'm becoming very bearish on, you know, America in the next nine months, right? So that means up until the election and after. And there's a lot of things to be very scared about as relates to the divisiveness that's going to happen because of this election, the divisiveness that's going to happen because of the inevitable hacking from Russia. Why does that matter? Because as Clint said, if they get into one voter roll and they prove that they were in there and they can... And then Biden or Trump can say, you know what, this, this election, whichever way it goes, is fraudulent because I have proof now that Russia was in this voter roll, um, meaning Russia screwed the ballots. Let's just make it simple as that. Then you can put the whole election into question. 
and we have a president who doesn't stand by precedent. Um, now, to be fair, um, a, a very influential Republican reminded me yesterday when I said this, don't forget that as to delegitimizing elections, if you're saying Trump would do that, his view is that the Democrats have put a lot of effort into delegitimizing his election, um, which is you know, perhaps true, but I don't care who does it. We have a lot of Lego pieces on the table to be assembled right now for disunity. That's a really bad analogy. But we're, we, we could be in a very dangerous place in the next, you know, through November into January. And again, concluding with David Brooks' line, I'll read it. One of the lessons of this crisis is that help isn't coming. Help isn't coming from some centralized place at the top of society. If you want real leadership, look around you. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think that that, I mean, as you were saying what you were saying, and I was a you know, hanging on the words and agreeing with them. Um, and frankly, well, frankly is the wrong word, but a lot of what I, what drives me to believe those things are the things that you've taught me and we've together discovered over these last several months, um, you know, from, from Clint Watts to my time in Memphis. Um, you know, you feel something that's very powerful. And that was the part, like that was the one part about last night that I felt like I failed. And what I, what I failed to do was communicate perhaps the opening of a curiosity to understand, well, what is an American really? And what, what is my role as a business person within that culture to make that culture stronger? One of the things that's worked pretty well up to now is you can just be Ann Randy and, and do your own thing and the, and the culture will sort of happen by the invisible hand. And that there's an element of that that I think is true. But if, but if, the, but if the, the, um, the priority, the value, the principle that is guiding you is say economic first, which I don't have a problem with economic as a motivator. I just think if it's mixed well with love, it's amazing what you could create. And, 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 and so my point being, I think if you actually understood, and again, and again, I say this from observation, in all the miles, and you know, I went on this one trip, it's not this one trip, I went across the country like f five times by train, four times by car, I've done it by motorcycle all in the last two years. And, all, and, so my, and my point is this, these pools in Missouri with the people drink, they're not everywhere. They're in limited places. These bad people, they're not everywhere. They're in limited places. And the nuance of some of the ways people get confused are just that. They're nuances. They're not these black and white evil or good things. It's, it's not the way life works. So I th and, and by the way, you can love a person like that. You can love a person that has layers. This thing with did with Kristen. The thing I think that Kristen and then we discover we discover through MS in this treatment is you discover the layers of truth and that changes your biology. Well, how do you do that through direct conversation and understanding and learning and being open minded? If, if you just give someone a black and white, there's nothing to be learned. There's nothing to be given. There's nothing to change the energy of a person. So if I had hoped something last night, I had hoped like maybe through my communications, people will be open to the notion, oh, wow, my business could be more. And I, and I didn't do the greatest job or certainly, well, maybe not with him. And, and so, and, and so that you get to today and I think, man, I can't just stand aside and have us go back and do this so that the person that we elect president of the United States says this just terrible thing. Anyway, so three quick thoughts. So one is um, when we, so if you are a CEO of a publicly traded company, that gentleman we're kind of referring to obliquely yesterday was the one who said things are going to sort of go back to normal at my massive, massive iconic firm. Um, he's still not let off the hook on shareholder returns, right? He's still hired to do that job. And that framework is not going to change. And nor should it come, right? And I'm uh, sympathetic to that, by the way, but go ahead. I know you are. And we shouldn't be heartbroken when he said, and that was an off the record group and he was saying the truth. He's like, look, man, I, I got a kid. Effectively what he was saying is I have a kick-ass business. We make billions of dollars. I love the model. I don't want to change. I, I, mean, why am I, I can't change. I'm not allowed to change. It. And maybe some millennials will come to work more. Maybe some old folks will come to work less, you know, whatever. Um, and, and remember, it's part one, part two. I want to be very clear. When you were talking about the pools in Missouri, you said bad people. There was an italics in your voice, and I know you were air quoting it. These aren't bad people, right? These are folks who don't have a shared consequence. And um, remember, they're like 
how many cases, what's the number right now? How many cases are there, are there in Missouri that were not in old folks homes? So I'm, I'm making this distinction. If you're in a state and someone died in your state in an old folks home, I don't think that hits your concept as a shared consequence. I don't think you see that as a risk unless you've got a family in old folks home and live in old folks home. So if you're the 99% of other people in that state of Missouri, for example, and there's 500 dead, 250 in old folks home or some number like that, you know, there's been this tiny number of people around you who have died. And you know, you're 18 to 35 and you're full of sex hormone and you want to go dance in a pool with girls like and boys I ain't gonna stop because what are you talking about who's dying right so and then the third point and this is maybe most interesting to me is you tom i since last night to today i haven't seen you so agitated uh, and i saying that I'm, I'm saying that from a position of empathy it's a hard word um you you were texting me last night. You got shook up by that comment, and I, I get it. And, and then that tweet, and you've worked really, really hard not to talk about the Oval Office or talk about the president. And I don't know if most people know, I guess I'm not going to out you, but like, you're not a Democrat as far as I understand, um, historically. And, um, and we've worked really hard not to make this partisan or talk about the president. And I don't know. That's, a, that's, a, that's something notable today. And that words matter. Well, you know what part of it is for me? Part of it is for me. It's like, like the rest of us, I'm a human being, right? And when boys, in my case, gather on the, play, on the playground, we act differently. We act like a mob. And there's like things you can do and there's things you can't do. And it's true as a grown up you're supposed to stay within the crew generally. Some people are willing to sort of push the crew, some people aren't. Some people push the crew for just for sake of pushing the crew because it makes them feel good. Some people want to push the crew, but they're afraid to push the crew because it's just why, who wants to deal with the bother? I think I'm one of those. I mean, I, don't, I, I generally speaking, I'm a relatively sensitive person who doesn't want to always be pushing the crew. And then there are these moments where I think, if you're not gonna open your mouth, Who's going to open their mouths? Like, who are the people who are actually going to open their mouths? And like a Cassandra, because that's a little bit how I feel, RP. I feel a little bit like a Cassandra. I feel a little bit like Quixote at the windmill with the damn lance or whatever the thing is. He's hitting the, the you know, I feel that way a little bit. And then there's this part of me that says, OK, well, that's how it feels. And you just grow up and deal with it. Um, so that's, you know, that, and, and so, and as it relates to Trump, I believe, cause and Dan and I talk about this all the time. It's like, there are things that I find abhorrent in both parties. And generally speaking, yeah, I'm more conservative than not, but I also vote both ways. It's just who I am. Um, the, the solution is not in, in problem pointing out. It's just not, we need to know what the problems are. And I accept that but solutions are sort of a different thing. And so I, I, I like to think that I have some degree of restraint in that realm. But then I think there are moments where I think, you know, you better open your mouth. And then, you know, often it's emotional. Like I'm, I'm just feeling emotional based on those concurrence of events that happened over the, the last 24 hours. But I mean, you know, I, I, I come back and I meet these people and see these things. And then I read that in the newspaper and I think that's the president of the United States. By the way, I don't read the newspaper. I saw it online. Um, and it saddens the hell out of me. And it's not a coincidence that I read the David Brooks article moments before I saw that. Well, that's responsibility, right? Um, the herd mentality of sort of watching things happen and then finally saying enough. That's, that's too much right there. And what's, so you, you know, it's the responsibility of people who can to raise their voice about things they must. And um, what's ironic about that is the people who support this president, the polling data for people who support this president is just largely a flat line from before he was elected to now. They don't seem to be moved one way or the other by what he does. Not More people don't join, more people don't quit, 
the depth of feeling for him doesn't change uh, among this core group of people. And I can guarantee you that tweet isn't going to change that. Uh, I spoke with a political scientist, a great political scientist yesterday, and she's nonpartisan by design. She's just trying to figure, she's a, she's a election predictor, professor and pollster and PhD and all that stuff. And her description of our body politic as compared, oh, sorry, let's call it sorry, electorate, as compared to America historically or other nations or the democracies is that it's, um, it's sick. She doesn't mean that we're bad or that it's very unusual to see this steady line of support that does not change and the steady line of hatred that does not change for a president. It's a very weird thing. And, you're, um, and then you start getting into questions of electoral math and electoral, electoral college and all this. But um, so, so people like you are a nightmare scenario for the Republicans. If you were, I don't know that you were, but if you were like an on the edge voter for Trump, you're a soft Trump supporter. There are just very, very few of them, and it's not clear what'll kick them off. And one question people have is, well, all right, look, we're going to have 100, we'll have 130,000 people dead by July. Uh, an estimate from University of Washington just came out that said 225,000 dead in America by August 1, I think it was, or September 1. And you could look at that and say, ooh, that's bad for Trump. I'm not sure it matters. That core isn't going to move, if you want my kind of prognostication on that. Just FYI, I know I'm kind of going yeah. down. No, and I, and if you recall, I you know yet last night I, I showed this, um, and uh, you know there's people might look at this picture and think like, oh my gosh, the ironies I see in that picture. Um, you know they wouldn't see these things as ironies, and I think if you spoke to them, you would uh, be surprised by what you might walk away with. Um, and the point there is just that uh, the, the things that are communicated to them creates this uh, opportunity for disdain, which is to say they feel very put upon by certain kinds of Americans, and Trump's their, Trump is their, their bully. He's the guy who actually defends them. You don't have to, I mean, look, if, if I, I would just offer up if, you, if I'm sounding crazy to you, like I think if you were standing there with me, I think you'd be affected by it. But, but I just want to emphasize in your point that I don't think those people you're talking about, and you're right, I think are, though they too are very misunderstood as a whole. There's individuals who probably fit the profile you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, there's like some, well, because most, not most people, but most people who probably live near us or maybe that are watching this, think of the folks that put up the signs you showed or the Trump supporters as having a strong overlap with you know neo-nazis kkk racist this and that and right. while i think neo-nazis racist and kkk are you know high high majority trump supporters like let's say over 95 percent that does not mean that 95 percent trump supporters are neo-nazis and blah, 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 right so uh, well i think this picture which i brought it back up again which is one of the reasons i like it so much if you met them the sign actually uses uh, signaling to, to express their highest priorities. They're like, oh, that's a great point. Yeah, they're really loving. Like when you first meet them and, 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 you know, we talk about race, we talk about immigration, we go there, we do go there. But the, you know, if you sort of feel their prioritization and the way they navigate life, I mean, you can see in the picture, there's a pro-life sticker there. They are very religious. You know, you may have issues with that politically speaking, but it, you know, th their priorities are very much of like this spiritual, religious, love-driven thing. So, anyway. Brilliant. An unbelievably influential Republican leader said to me after Trump won, and this guy has the polling data, he has the insights. He said, you don't, you'll never get it. The people who voted for Trump were looking for the biggest middle finger they could give to America, and that's what he was. Yes. Right. Like you don't get me. You call me deplorable. You call me a racist. You like, you think I'm this, you think I'm that. I'm actually someone who has a Bible. I believe in a family. I believe in a neighbor. I believe in a constitution. I believe in. And, um, and Hillary, you know, that's why she was probably such a bad candidate versus him. Roiled so much antipathy from them, so much anger that they had to, 
defend themselves the way they viewed it um, in their way of life. And who are you to tell me my Bible's wrong? Who are you to tell me that pro-choice or pro-life is wrong? Who are you to tell me the Second Amendment is wrong? And my way of life is wrong. And so here's my middle finger to you. Yeah. And I bet that group is the one that's just sort of stayed with them. And they won't care about that tweet. And the bad news, Tom, is no one's going to talk about that tweet in a week. You know, one thing I've said about the beginning of this presidency is, remember the John McCain thing he said during the campaign? John McCain, revered American icon, God rest his soul, war hero, POW, Vietnam, senator, you know, superstar. Uh, pretty bipartisan so far as Republicans go, constructionist leader, foreign policy, excellent guy. I've had the pleasure of working with him and meeting him. I mean, a big fan of his. Donald Trump said in an interview or debate or something during the campaign, he derided McCain for being a POW. A POW. I prefer heroes who aren't caught. Yeah. And he, of course, John McCain's experience in the Hanoi Hilton was broken arms, broken legs. I mean, you know, fucking torture to the highest extent. Pardon me, French. And here comes Trump saying this. I said, oh, he's done. That's it. He's done. He's done. He's done. He's done. No way he's going to win after that. Oh, okay. Then we get to the Billy Bush comments about grabbing women, sexually assaulting women. Like he says, live recording. I sexually assault women. Ah, he's done. That's it. He's done. Nope. And then it's just the roll of this. This keeps going on and on and on. And, and it, 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 we have become punched in the face so many times by it. We're totally inert to it. It doesn't matter anymore. Now, one more point. I asked a big Democratic strategist yesterday. I said, Joe Biden, can you show up? Is he there? Is he mentally competent to be able to hold this campaign together? The answer was absolutely he is. I, have no, I don't know. This guy says he is 100%. He's a gaffe machine, always has been. And then he says, but look, this isn't going to be a campaign where you're going to get in trouble for gaffes and saying things. So look at what the president's done for three and a half years. Uh, interestingly, I don't think they're going to hold Biden to the same standard. I think we're going to judge Joe Biden as we think Joe Biden is. You know, you're supposed to be the staid, centrist senator. So when you make a gaffe, like we judge against that, and we're going to judge Trump against what we think Trump is. Anyway. You know, my own, uh, yeah, I, I, my own politics vis-a-vis -vis gay marriage have been for as long as I can remember, why not? You know, I, I, I lived in, worked in Provincetown as a 14-year-old and as a 15-year-old in a restaurant when AIDS broke out. I've lived in like gay communities most of my life. It's something I've always been comfortable with and I've always believed that. And, you know, Barack Obama ran for president of the United States and won as a Democrat against gay marriage. He was civil unions, like that's how he was elected. That was his platform. So I was left of him, however you wanna put it, okay? And the law changed. And then there became this moment where there was this, uh, just so much condemnation of anyone who was even marginally in question of that. And I remember when that was happening, I was like, you are gonna push these people away. I mean, you, you gave your own guy a break and you're, you're condemning these people. You're asking them to evolve overnight and they're not gonna like it, it's gonna hurt them. And, and especially if you insult them with saying they're racist or homophobes or evil or whatever. And it just started to happen. I remember at the time thinking like, wow, you're gonna lose a lot of people along these lines. And I think though, like that's about when it started now, it, it probably started before that. But it was also during the onslaught of the, the, um, the internet. And so all of a sudden like, to, to be mean became easy. It, it's easy to be mean. You can be mean to people all day long. It was hard to be mean to people in mass numbers in 2005. Well, it's like you know, how we people. honk at people in our car too, right? Like if I was walking down an aisle in a grocery store, I wouldn't yell at somebody, slow down, hurry up, get out of my way. Right. But if I'm in a car honking the horn somehow, you know, feels like an easier way to be offensive or, I, or it's more easy to be offensive, similar to Twitter, you know, the anonymity of it, the distance. So those are the things, because I think, you know, and Michael Moore, I, I, God, I, he, he, he gave a talk. It was, I don't know, it was like October 31st, 2016. And he said exactly what you just said. You're about to see the biggest F you that America has ever, right? And he was dead right. And that F you is really complex. It is not as simple as all the bad people gave the finger to all the good people. That's not what happened. What happened was, 
we got really good at dividing ourselves and the frustrations that boiled on both sides elected somebody who can say, when they start looting, we start shooting. Sad to me. Anyway, I don't want to be too dramatic here. And I, I, I on the other hand, I do want to, uh, I don't want to like back off either. I, I don't want to just uh, assume the cool kids know what to do next. And, and you know, we, I step aside and let the cool kids do the cool things. Um, so, you know, one thing I, we haven't mentioned, and I, it's not, it's just, you know, the, the, the George Floyd thing. I mean, holy Moses, <laughs> I mean, what in the world is this? I, it's not, I, I just want to make sure we don't like, I don't want to look back on this in 10 years and say, we didn't even mention this atrocity. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And those, here's the irony of this. Those riots will help, those will, those will motivate more Trump voters, but they will also motivate critical parts of the Democratic base, base to vote too. Yeah. Well, and it's going to be obviously more fertile ground for the Clint Watts phenomena, which is that other actors are going to use pulling us apart. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to pull us apart. Yeah. And, and I just, I'm glad you brought it up. And I, I said it to Dan at the top. It's like, I don't want to go too far into it. It's just, it makes me sad. And to be clear, it makes me sad. I, I, I don't, of course, I don't want to see that. Maybe not. Of course. I think it's horrible. And, and all the issues around it, it's hard for me to identify. I appreciate that. I totally appreciate that. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. In, in many ways, that, that's the subject matter. That's what it is. When they start looting, we start shooting. But uh, all because of that poor, poor man. Passing a counterfeit bill. Similar to the guy in New York. I forgot his name. I, I can't Eric breathe. Garner. Like, Eric Garner. Eric Garner selling loose cigarettes. We'd, we'd have a little more patience, not a lot, if this was like a spree shooter. Yeah. Insanity. Okay, so so before we go, um, well, let me ask just one question and then and we'll go. <laughs> do you do you see yourself on a journey? And, and it turns out COVID was what, what brought us into this journey. I um, have, uh, I can't, I've learned an unbelievable amount in these 80 days, right? In 55 days we've done this. Um, and I hope that I've grown. I think I have the exposure to you and other great thinkers has certainly brought tools and strength to my ability to help for sure. Um, and I am, as I mentioned before, I'm bearish on where America goes, meaning I'm negative on where America goes in the next nine months. It's going to be a brutal nine months. All right. So, so I'm going to do a call to action then if I can do what our, do, do exactly what RP has said before. Lead yourself, do what David Brooks wrote about today, lead yourself. And by the way, if it's easy, this is my general feeling. If it's easy, you're doing something wrong. It's going to be harder than you'd think to be thoughtfully leading yourself through a difficult time. And so it's, this won't happen the way the ozone did. We were all freaked out about the ozone and then one day it was just gone. This isn't going to be one of those. Like you don't want it. You don't want people rioting in Minneapolis and you don't want people dying of COVID. And so navigating all these different things, not to mention 25% unemployment and not to mention, wouldn't it be nice if we get to the other side of this and feel like, man, we live in a better place than ever. Wouldn't that feel good? Well, okay. It's going to be hard. Own it. Nothing easy is really ever worth doing. Right. But, or, or only things that are harder worth doing. I don't know. What's the expression? Sorry. But the, um, yeah. And I think you're making a great point, which is th there's going to be a vaccine, you know, 75% chance there'll be a vaccine in 18 months. And that'll appear like we're done. The ozone hole is sealed. Um, but this economic collapse and this national division right. is not going to get sealed. That's right. And in the middle of it, we're going to need some kind of fiber that holds us together so that we can go somewhere. Because the way it feels to me is we're going like this. Right? We're going this way. We are. Of course we are. 
Jesus. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, you know what? More leaders like Stacy and bring more attention to them so we can learn more lessons. The rest of us can be like Stacy. <laughs>